What's up, my chooms? So, as many of you guys know, I've been playing the living hell out of Cyberpunk 2077, hence why the content uploads have been slow, but you know, it's a once in a decade type of game, so I would be remiss as a dedicated gamer to not dedicate at least a good chunk of my life to it. The game is definitely a bright spot in what has unquestionably been a miserable year for the world. So... Looking back at 2020, I'm reminded about everything that has happened so far. We've had Cyberpunk 2077 being unplayable on most hardware, like the base Xbox One and PS4 models. We've also had the release of a new generation of consoles that 99% of people have no chance of getting due to asshole scalper bots buying all the supplies. And we also have many people who are too butthurt to accept the results of an election just because democracy didn't happen to go their way this time. But what 2020 will of course be known for more than anything is the worst epidemic since the 1918 Spanish flu. I'm, of course, talking about the coronavirus, the latest demonic disease to come out of the Orient thanks to their culture's embrace of eating fucked up and disgusting things like bats, pangolins, koalas, snakes, polar bears, and God knows what else. The disease, like Satan appropriately, has many names such as COVID-19, the China virus, the Wuhan flu, the commie cough, the Kung Pao sicken, but whatever you choose to call it, I think everybody agrees it has been a major pain in the ass for all of us. Now, everybody is well aware of the respiratory damage the virus can cause and how dangerous it is to people who already have some pre-existing health problems, but what hasn't been discussed nearly as much is if the commie cough has any kind of link to hair loss, which for many is a death sentence in its own right. I was curious about this, so I went ahead and and did some digging to find out if coronavirus has any link to hair loss and whether or not conventional hair loss treatments like finasteride can be used to possibly mitigate the damage caused by this disease and the research I found yielded some pretty surprising answers. So it hasn't been discussed much, but on some health-related sites and blogs, there have been reports of people having minor to severe hair loss after contracting the woohoo virus. A popular example would be the politically obnoxious actress and Generation X sex symbol, Alyssa Milano, who got the commie cough back in March or April, I think, just when things were going to hell in the West. She was also on the well-known quack Dr. Oz's show, where she discussed symptoms related to COVID, like stomach issues, headache, brain fog, and she also uploaded a video, I think it was on her Instagram, where she showed how much hair she was lo losing after running a detangling brush through her scalp several times. So, these reports of COVID-related hair loss aren't limited to hot 90s actresses. There have also been other reports documenting the same things, which I'll link below. So, it does seem, though, that COVID can indeed cause acute hair loss in certain individuals. However, this type of acute shedding in response to a disease is not unique to COVID and not at all related to antigenic alopecia. Likely, this is just telogen effluvium, which is temporary accelerated shedding brought on, brought on by either emotional or physical trauma. It is also known as stress-related hair loss, and logic would dictate that something like COVID, which carries with it very uh, strong physical symptoms as well as a good amount of fear, could have a causal role in something like telogen effluvium. Now, like I said earlier, Telogen effluvium is not permanent and is not related to antigenic alopecia, which does, which does in fact cause permanent hair loss if it is not treated soon enough. So the individuals who are getting telogen effluvium from COVID will likely have their symptoms reversed over time after they recover eventually. But what about androgenic alopecia in COVID, you ask? Is there any connection and are people who are predisposed to male pattern baldness more likely to get COVID or to have a worse outcome if they do get COVID? Well, I know this sounds absurd and there isn't enough data to give a definitive answer in any case, uh, particularly in part because COVID is, uh, just keep in mind, it's a very new disease, but there is, in fact, some scientific evidence of a connection between COVID and androgenic alopecia, and it's something everybody who is fighting male pattern baldness should at least know about, I think. So, the first hint I found that there may be a connection between COVID and androgens is the fact that the incidence of severe COVID is in fact sex and age related. This chart I'm showing you here shows that you're more likely to get severe COVID if you're a male than a female. This shows that 70% of hospitalized patients were male and only 30% were female. Also, the chance of dying from COVID is 1.5 to 2.5 times higher if you are a male versus a female, as shown in this chart. 
On the next graph here, you see that COVID fatalities are extremely rare in pre-adolescence, which is why the experts like Dr. Fauci say it is relatively safe for pre-adolescent children to keep going to school despite this pandemic, although he also stresses precautions like social distancing and uh, masks still be implemented as the risks obviously aren't going to be zero and kids can still spread COVID to adults. So looking at this data, the thing that stands out the most is the difference in severity of COVID between men and women and between adults adults and children. So this raises the question as to whether sex hormones have anything to do with COVID severity, and more precisely, whether there is a link between COVID and androgens. And once we start talking about androgens, the next question should be whether or not there is a link between androgenic alopecia and COVID. So let's go ahead and dive balls deep into this and find out. Now, Everybody knows the virus inherits its namesake because it has spikes around it that make it look like a crown, hence the name coronavirus. And in case you haven't figured it out, corona is the Spanish and Latin word for crown, not beer. Anyways, the spikes aren't just cosmetic to make the virus look like it's not balding. The spikes actually have a physiological role in interacting with the membranes of the cells that they are attacking. The spikes work by attaching to the ACE receptor of the cell, and this is the same receptor that the class of drugs known as ACE inhibitors attach to, and ACE inhibitors are prescribed to treat high blood pressure. Now, COVID has nothing to do with blood pressure directly, but this is just the way COVID gets into the cell, and specifically the cells it targets are the pneumocytes, which are the lung cells that are found in the alveoli of the lungs and are responsible for gas exchange needed in respiration. Hence why COVID is classified as a SARS virus, with SARS, S-A-R-S, standing for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, because COVID fucks up your breathing. So... It turns out that it takes more than just hooking on to the ACE receptor for the virus to get into the cell. There is another protein on the cell membrane that is involved, which has the name TMPRSS2, which is a nice mouthful, but it stands for transmembrane protease serine 2. So the important thing about this protein is that it interacts with the virus spikes and primes them so that they're able to penetrate into the cell, and that is when shit gets real. Now, the interesting thing about TMPRSS2 PRSS2, which leads to the underlying point of this video, is that it is activated by androgens including DHT, dehydrotestosterone, which is yet another reason why DHT is a trash hormone because it apparently helps you get infected with the goddamn commie cough. So, COVID may indeed be androgen dependent, and we know androgenic alopecia is androgen dependent, so is there any link between COVID and androgenic alopecia? So, as it turns out, there have been a few small studies that indicate that the answer may very well be yes. There may be a link, though as you'll see, the science does need some subsequent testing to curb confirm this, but initial reports do show a possible link. So... The first report comes from patients hospitalized for severe COVID in two hospitals in Spain over the course of two weeks from March to April 2020. There were 41 patients, all men, who had severe COVID. Out of all of them, 71% were over Norwood 2 and 39% were between Norwood 4 and 7, which means they had hair loss ranging from very minor, maybe just a receding hairline, to being completely bald, which is what a Norwood 7 is. Now, they compared the incidence of hair loss in the patients with COVID to the estimated incidence of androgenic alopecia in an age-matched healthy population. This incidence of androgenic alopecia in healthy men was estimated to be between 31 and 51%. So the fact that there was a higher incidence of androgenic alopecia, uh, namely 71% in men with severe COVID, raises the possibility that androgenic alopecia is in fact a risk factor for getting COVID-19. Of course, this at this point is just a correlation and not necessarily a causation. It's based on an estimate of incidence of androgenic alopecia in the general population, which is really just a guess at this point, but it does at least suggest that people who have androgenic alopecia may be more likely to get more severe COVID. So... This report alone is interesting, but it isn't strong enough data to draw any conclusions from. Fortunately, we also have a database from the UK that looked at 1,941 male hospitalized patients for who were tested for COVID, and amongst them, 356 were tested positive for COVID, and the remaining 1,605 patients all tested negative. The database contained data on androgenic alopecia and was based on a modified 
by Norwood scale with pattern one, meaning no baldness, up to pattern four, which was severe baldness. So a little more generalized than the Norwood scale, but still uh, an effective way to gouge the severity of hair loss. But anyways, the analysis showed that amongst all the patients, the worse your hair loss, the greater the chance that you will test positive for COVID-19, which is showed in this table here. Now, as you can see, amongst the two groups of patients, the average age and weight were essentially the same, but the incidence of positive COVID tests went from 15% in pattern one all the way to 20% in pattern four. Overall, patients with the worst hair loss had a 1.5 times chance of having a positive COVID test compared to the patients with no hair loss. So that's pretty significant. Again, this is just correlation, but it does further imply a link between androgenic alopecia and being infected with COVID-19. So the last report, again, comes from Spain, and this time they looked at 175 patients with severe COVID infections. This time, the patients included 122 men, and for the first time, it also included women, 53 women specifically. Of the total population of subjects, 67% had androgenic alopecia, including 79% of the men and 42% of the women. Again, they compared the incidence of androgenic alopecia in the general population, which was 31 to 51% for men, and at most 38% percent in women. So once again, there is more androgenic alopecia in hospitalized COVID patients than you would expect if androgenic alopecia had nothing at all to do with COVID since the hospitalized people have higher rates of androgenic alopecia compared to the general population. Now again, I know this goes into the whole correlation does not equal causation fallacy, but you have to understand that even though this is technically true, uh, correlation can still nevertheless imply causation, uh, even if there is just a correlation. I mean, to give you an example of this, cigarette smoking has for a long time been known to be linked to health problems, but that was known even before we could measure the progression of the diseases it is linked to, like heart disease and cancer, but we still understood a strong implication based on the fact that more people who smoked developed these diseases compared to non-smokers. So in that regard, we can clearly see a higher incidence and COVID in people with androgenic alopecia versus people who don't have it. And that shouldn't be dismissed just because it hasn't been definitively confirmed through the scientific method. Now remember, COVID is a very new disease, and all the studies on COVID at this point are just in the preliminary stage, but I do think this link between androgenic alopecia is one to take seriously just due to how many correlative reports we've had and how common androgenic alopecia is in men. But the real question is, if we assume the correlative data is correct and androgenic alopecia does somehow potentiate the coronavirus, will conventional treatments for androgenic alopecia like finasteride help mitigate it? Now, there haven't been studies done specifically on finasteride, unfortunately, but there is research underway on the use of antiandrogens in the treatment or prevention of COVID-19. Some of these treatments include bicalutamide, which is chemically similar to fluoridil, which is used for hair loss, although it's applied topically. Uh, and uh, there's also studies on degarolix and spironolactone, and neither of these are suitable for the use of men due to them causing hypogonadism, but they still play a role in suppressing DHT like finasteride, and as we discussed earlier, DHT is in fact the hormone which indirectly helps the coronavirus penetrate the cell membrane. What the exact correlation between having androgen-sensitive hair in the scalp and having androgen-sensitive pneumocytes is not clear, and maybe further research will demonstrate a link, but for now, it does seem like yet another reason why suppressing DHT is a very good idea. I mean, not only does DHT do all the nasty shit it's known, to, known for to our bodies, you know, like causing hair loss, giving us acne, and enlarging our prostate, but now it may even help kill us by helping the Kamikov do its job. It's possible that finasteride may help protect us against the virus. I mean, this is speculative, and I am not encouraging anyone to take finasteride and be under the impression that they're somehow protected from this disease, but I still think the whole subject was interesting enough to be worth making a video on. So, giving a too long, didn't read version of this video, number one, 
We know that COVID can cause acute hair loss via telogen effluvium, which is stress-related hair loss. And number two, preliminary data suggests that there may be a link between androgenic alopecia and being susceptible to COVID-19. And that's pretty much it. So for those who are using finasteride, uh, you still want to take all these other precautions necessary to protect yourself from this disease. But for now, you can do so knowing that finasteride may be giving you a little bit of extra protection. And I think that's pretty neat. All right, guys. So like I said, I've been investing a lot of time into cyber Punk 2077. The game pretty much owns my soul at this point, but I don't want you guys to get the impression that I am abandoning my YouTube channel. I mean, there's still a lot of subjects I want to cover, and I really like creating this content, so I'm going to continue creating content for as long as I have a YouTube channel. I mean, who knows? Maybe HairGuard will get enough copyright strikes on my videos to get my channel deleted, but assuming that doesn't happen, I will continue to upload videos covering the subject of hair loss, because, you know, there's no shortage of topics to cover. I have a lot of projects on the horizon, but for the next couple of days, I wouldn't expect me to be super active on YouTube or social media or checking my emails or anything like that uh, just because uh, I've been so invested into the world of Cyberpunk 2077 and the world of Night City. I find it really fascinating. You know, Witcher 3 is my favorite game of all time, so naturally I'm going to be spending a lot of time playing CD Projekt Red's follow-up, Cyberpunk 2077, and I highly rec recommend other people do as well. But if you are going to play Cyberpunk 2077, I do recommend you at least have a PlayStation 4 Pro on base PS4 and Xbox One models, the game, uh, at least for now, isn't very playable. I mean, at least not until a couple patches. Maybe they'll fix it up a little bit, much like they did after the initial launch of Witcher 3, which had some issues as well. But in the meantime, I hope you guys stay safe. I think the worst of uh, the year, 2020, is behind us, thank goodness, and I hope you guys have a great week. Take care.